All right, welcome everybody. Uh, those of you live online, hello as well. Um, thanks for coming. So tonight, we're gonna, not tonight, this afternoon, we're gonna talk about astrophotography, which is something that I have been super passionate about for probably five or six years now. And it's such a just cool genre of photography in that there's so much to it. You can go as in-depth as you want to. Um, you can just, ah, there's just so many good technical things to learn. So what I wanna do today, what I wanna do this afternoon for you guys is give you an introduction to astrophotography talk about really as a beginner or even an intermediate astrophotographer what you can do to improve your images how to really get started some equipment considerations basically just a very well-rounded bit about astrophotography now I do need to say one thing uh, of all the genres of photography this is probably one of the most technical because there's so much to it both scientifically how detectors work how sensors work in our cameras there's a lot to it and that makes it really awesome um, which is pretty cool and it's one of the reasons that I like it. So let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing uh, I want to say is uh, just a little bit about uh, who I am. My name is Forrest. Um, I teach and I actually direct Rocky Mountain School of Photography with my wife. We're, we're a photography school in Missoula, Montana, so other side of the country. Um, but we do all kinds of classes around the country. We do classes actually around the world. We're doing a Cuba workshop probably next year. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, rmsp.tv, that's pretty popular. I put videos up there every single week. So actually, if you want to learn more about astrophotography, I have more on there as well that kind of takes some next steps from this class that we're talking about today. Uh, our website and then obviously our Instagram if you guys want to follow along with the school and what we do. And I'll put these up at the end as well. Um, also, I just want to thank the event space. They're awesome. If you guys haven't been to anything before, go to more of them. They're really cool. And those of you watching online, you know how cool it is probably. It's an awesome thing. So definitely check them out some more. First thing I want to do is uh, actually just look at some pretty photos. So let's just look at what astrophotography is and what you can capture. Um, so these are some images by me. This is the Orion Nebula. Uh, this is actually a very good first target. If For those of you who are just getting started in astrophotography, this is something that you could expect to get. Another closer up on the Orion. This is the Rosette Nebula. The Andromeda Galaxy, one of my favorites, really pretty galaxy. Also, there was the solar eclipse. I count that as astrophotography. It's in the sky. So who saw that in the room? Pretty cool. Did anyone go down to like totality, the little path where it got fully dark? It's so sweet. Such a, such a cool experience. Uh, those of you who ever get a chance, go see totality. It looks like this, and it's amazing for like two minutes and 30 seconds. It gets cold. It gets dark. Birds start singing. It's just a really cool experience. So there's a little bit of inspiration, a little bit about what we're going to talk about thing I want to do next is why is astrophotography so hard? This is kind of going to be the theme of today's lecture is what makes it difficult and how can we improve that? How can we fix those different things that make it so difficult? So the first thing that makes astrophotography difficult is the movement of the sky. Obviously the earth is rotating all the time and so the sky is moving over our heads and that's really hard because if you want to get good images it's dark so you need to shoot objects for quite a long amount of time and they're moving so to get them sharp over time time present some challenges. Also, we have environmental factors. Wind and the moon cycle and temperature and atmosphere, all of those things can have huge impacts on our images and what they look like. All right. We also have a lot of noise with long exposures. Noise is something where you guys know the longer our exposure, the higher our ISO, the more noise we have in our photographs. So we have to fight that as well. And then also, the images are super dim, right? Like what we're shooting, honestly, a lot of the stuff you can't even see with the naked eye. If you look up there, you just see like a bunch of stars, especially in the city. You look up, you can't really see anything, right? But even when you're getting to a dark sky site, you look up and you see a little fuzzy blob, and that's a big, beautiful, colorful object, but you wouldn't know it. Also, focus is really difficult. Those of you who've tried this, getting nice tack sharp stars on top of the motions of the sky, also getting them crisp and focused is also difficult. So what's the goal? The goal is we want round stars that are nice and crispy and round. We want sharp stars that are small, small, nice, crisp, sharp stars. We want little or no noise, <laughs> if only, right? We can, we can try, we can dream, right? Little or no noise. And we want some contrast between the object and the background, right? We need to have black sky and bright object on top of that black sky. And I think I would add this. We want to get to a place where we have an efficient and repeatable workflow, something where we can do it again and again and again and not have to relearn it every time we do it. So simplicity in the workflow is really important, too. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these problems problems and these solutions and take them one at a time. So the first problem I want to talk about is the motions of the sky. That's kind of the first thing we need to battle as astrophotographers. So 
motions of the sky, you guys all know the Earth rotates underneath the stars. Pretty simple. And all of those stars appear to rotate around a fixed point in space. Northern Hemisphere, we call it the North Star. Southern Hemisphere, they don't really have anything, but the Southern Cross is kind of the representation that they have down in the Southern Hemisphere. All the stars are always rotating around those points. And what happens is, is that motion will give you star trails, which is another type of astrophotography that's really cool. You get the trailed stars. It's not really the topic of tonight or today. but Star trails can happen too. And the problem with this is it's great for star trails, but it's really bad for astrophotography. So how do we fix these motions? That's kind of what I want to talk about first. So let's look at an example here of motions of the sky. Here on the left, we have what stars should look like. They're nice, they're crisp, they're round, they look good. And here is an example of bad stars, right? They all move. And probably most people who've shot astrophotography have taken images like that. I've shot hundreds of images that look like that. And it's such a bummer because sometimes on the back of the camera, you zoom in and you look at them in the field and you're like, yes, these look great. And then you get back on the computer where you have a little bit bigger of a screen and you zoom in and really they look pretty terrible, right? So you want to make sure that you're getting good crisp stars. Here's a little, little example of what's happening. Um, the blue arrow represents the motions of the sky, not the Earth. The Earth's going the other direction. Someone corrected me once on that. Um, but we've got those motions. So let's talk about how we actually fix it. There's two techniques. There's two ways we can fix, and not really fix, but compensate for the motions of the sky. The first way is we could use short exposures, right? If we made our shutter speed so fast, there wasn't enough time for the stars to move an appreciable amount. That's totally doable. The other thing would be to use something like this, use a tracker to track with the night sky. And trackers come in all different shapes and sizes, many of which can be purchased at B&H. Oh, so convenient. <laughs> they didn't pay me to say that. I just like this store. It's so cool. Being from Montana, we have like nothing near this big as like anything in our state. Uh, this is just so cool. Uh, so good. So let's first talk about the using shorter exposures technique, the technique that won't cost you anything. Just you can go out and you can do it any time. So if our shutter speed is fast enough, how long the shutter is open, we can make it so quick that those stars won't move much. And I say appreciable here, or a perceptible amount, because obviously they'll move a little bit. But if you can get a fast enough shutter speed, much like shooting a runner running down a track, you can get it fast enough that it stops that action. The rule that we like to use as astrophotographers is called the 400 rule. And the 400 rule is kind of a benchmark. A lot of people, some people will quote the 500 rule. Some people will quote the 300 rule. It's somewhere in that general vicinity. But 400 rule is kind of what I like to use. So here's the 400 rule. What you want to do is you want to take 400 and you want to divide it by the full frame focal length of your lens. Now I say full frame focal length, that means if you have a crop sensor camera, you need to multiply the focal length by 1.5 or 1.6 or 2 if you have a mirrorless or micro four thirds camera, depending on the size sensor. Okay, So we're going to divide 400 by the full frame equivalent focal length of our lens. And what this is going to give us is the longest shutter speed we can use without there being trailing, right? The result is the longest shutter speed we can use. So that means that if we did that and we got a solution, we'll do some examples in a minute, but if we got a solution of, say, 10 seconds, it means if we used a 10 second shutter speed, we shouldn't see trailing. If we used 11 seconds, we might start to see some trailing. Now, is it perfect? No. Does it work pretty well? Yeah. The reason it's not perfect is, you guys, if you think about it, the sky is all in the northern, northern hemisphere, appears to all be rotating around the North Star, the North Star, Polaris, whatever you want to call it, right? Well, the amount of movement in the course of an exposure, if you're shooting a star right next to the North Star, that's going to move a very little amount in the course of a night, just around a little tiny circle around the North Star. If you're shooting something near the celestial equator, it's got to go around the entire sky. So the 400 rule is calibrated for somewhere in the middle. It's not going to be perfect for every object, but it gets you close. Okay, so. Better to go shorter than this if you can. Uh, that's why some people like to use the 300 rule. You'll also hear the 500 rule. It just depends. So let's look at some examples. We've got the 400 rule. Let's say that we have a 16 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. Let's say we want a big wide field shot of the Milky Way coming out of the ground, those super epic shots that you see. All right. It's a full frame camera, so all we got to do is take 400 divided by 16 millimeters and we get 25 seconds. Simple. If we shoot 26 seconds, we might see some blur. 25 seconds, we shouldn't see any blur happening. 
Another example, a 200 millimeter lens on a Canon crop sensor. So that means the lens actually says 200 millimeter on it. Say it's a 70 to 200. Well, what we have to do first is multiply 200 by 1.6 because it's a crop sensor Canon camera. And we get 320. And then we take 400 divided by 320 and we get 1.25 seconds. Meaning, if we shoot shorter than that, we should be good at or shorter. If I got that result, I'd probably shoot at one second just to know that I got those crispy stars. Okay, So that's kind of our benchmark. Here's the problem, though. <laughs> is one second very long when you're shooting at night? No, it's terribly short. right? Like One second is very quick. And so we're going to have to compensate for that short shutter speed to get a properly exposed photo with ISO or with aperture or something like that. And whenever I say ISO, we start to think, oh, noise is going to start to creep in and our image quality is going to go down. So it's not the optimal solution. All right. So what it means is like good, but not great. OK? So these targets are super dim. And we, we basically, if we, like I just said, if we need to use a very fast shutter speed, we have to compensate with a higher ISO, which means more noise and, and just not great things. So on the other hand, we have a tracker, something that can actually move with the sky and is calibrated to move with the sky. All right, so let's talk a little bit about trackers and mounts, the other side of the, the coin. So trackers and mounts are calibrated to make one full rotation every 24 hours. And that makes sense. If you watched the stars, if you could watch them during the day, they would make one full rotation around the North Star or the Southern Cross per day. And the movement mimics what the sky is actually doing. All right, now here's the thing. Trackers aren't perfect because they're you know, machines, they're mechanical devices. There's going to be errors in how well they're machined. The more expensive ones are going to do better. But the, the shutter speed that you can use, that exposure that you can use, the better the tracker, the longer you can go. So as an example, this is the, uh, we'll talk about more about these, but this is the iOptron Sky Guider. I know for a fact that with a 200 millimeter lens on this specific tracker, I can get about 30 seconds out of it. Now you may say that's not great, but compared to one second with a 200 millimeter lens, 30 seconds is an improvement of 30 times. That's a lot more light to get into the frame in the same amount of time, right? Or a larger amount of time, so we can use a lower ISO. In my observatory at home, where I actually do my astrophotography, I have a mount that can track indefinitely. It's, per, it's machined so precise that it can track perfectly for as long as I need it to go, which is pretty awesome. So it all is cost, benefit, that type of thing. Okay, Some trackers even have what's called go-to functionality, I should say. Uh, this does not, but some of them you can say like, boop, 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 go to the Orion Nebula, and it's just like, and it points at the Orion Nebula, and it tracks it throughout the night. Or go to Andromeda, which is really cool because you guys think about it. If you're looking up at the sky, shooting objects that are invisible to the naked eye, how do you find them? Well, the tracker or the mount can actually find them for you in a lot of cases, which is pretty cool. All right, so here's some mounts. Just want to show you guys some things. Uh, you can kind of look at this on your own. This will be recorded, obviously. You can, those of you watching live, you could take a screenshot. But these are kind of some of my favorite mounts that I've looked at from the beginner kind of level, the basic level, all the way up to the go-to level. To give you guys some idea on price, the basic column, they usually cost about $200, is right about there, which is pretty good. And that'll get you like 30 seconds, 15 seconds of really good, precise tracking all the way up to the go-to mounts at the end, and those with the right hardware will go indefinitely. So you can kind of go as long as you need to go, which is pretty cool. Um, my personal favorite, um, I really think for beginners, the iOptron Sky Guider, the one under the intermediate column, that's like my favorite. I've recommended that to many photographers through the years. Um, one step nicer than that that I really also would recommend is the Fornax Light Track 2, the one right there. That is a really stellar mount. It's awesome. It's very precise. It costs, though, about $1,000. So the price goes way up. This is about $400,000. And then like the Lohman DG11 or the Lost Man DG11, that's like a $4,000 mount. So price goes way up as you get there. But you guys, get something basic, start with it. You'd be surprised what it can do for you. Huge improvements with very little amounts of money. So let's talk a little bit about using a tracker. And I should say real quick, um, if you guys actually go to our website, uh, you go to rmsp.tv slash tracker, I have a whole video, a YouTube video that's 15 minutes long that walks you through this process of using a tracker much more in depth. So you can definitely check that out um, after the fact right there. So here's kind of the rough idea. If you've got a tracker and you want to use it, 
this is about how you would go about doing that. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get your tracker aligned with the pole, aligned with the North Star or the Southern Cross. Because you think about it, it's going to rotate around that point. The tracker needs to know where that point is in order to be calibrated correctly. So what you'll do is you'll take your tripod out and you'll get it placed roughly facing north or south, depending on what hemisphere you're in. If you're near the equator, you can kind of pick one, uh, depending on whether it's visible. The next step is to level the tripod. Having a very level tripod is a great thing for using a tracker like this. All right, And then what you're going to do is you're going to use the polar scope. And what the polar scope is, I'm going to take my camera off here for a second. The polar scope is there's a little telescope that runs through this tracker. And every tracker has a polar scope. How they work is a little bit different. But you'll actually, there's like a little telescope that I can look through just like that. And that polar scope is what you'll use to align it with the North Star or the Southern Cross. This particular tracker, you'll align it. And then you'll put the camera back on. Obviously, the camera kind of blocks that telescope's view. So you'll put this back on. And obviously, you want a nice sturdy tripod that doesn't shift much once you do that. But you get it aligned with the pole. So that's the next step is use the polar scope to get things aligned. One little product that I'll point out that I think is awesome um, is this thing called the QHY CCD Pole Master. Uh, the Pole Master is a little camera that you actually clip to the polar scope. It kind of replaces the polar telescope in your, in your mountain. You can read more about it. But what it'll do is actually aid in the alignment process. Because if you think about it, you guys, if you've got that telescope and that tracker that you're using, telescope meaning camera lens, and that tracker that you're using, the precision that you can align it with the North Star or with the Southern Cross, if you're a little bit off, it's not going to track the right circle through the night. So this alignment stage is very important. You want to make sure it's perfectly aligned with what you're trying to do. And something like the, the Pole Master can help you do that. But again, adds expense, adds complexity, all of that kind of thing. All right. Next thing you'll do is you'll turn on the tracker. Right? There's just an on-off switch. Switch it on, and it starts tracking. One more step I'll add is if it's a go-to mount, if it's a mount that can go and kind of point you at an object, you can do a star alignment, as it's called, which is where basically you say, all right, mount, I'm now aligned with the North Star or the Southern Cross. I want you to learn where things are in the sky. And so it points at a star, and it says center it, and you center it, and you center another star. And from that point on, it's actually able to point things where they need to go. It can tell you where stuff is, which is pretty cool. And then finally, you'll find the object just by loosening your head, the ball head, or the whatever type of head you have on your camera. You'll find your object. You'll get it centered. You'll lock it down. And then once it's locked, make sure it's locked up. There we go. Once it's locked, you would go ahead and actually start taking photographs. And you'd know that this would be rotating once every 24 hours, keeping things good. Now, what I would do when that's happening, or when I first buy my mount, is I would take a series of test exposures at slowly longer and longer shutter speeds. And I'd see how long can I go before I start to see trails. Because the 400 rule now doesn't matter. You've got a tracker that's going to move through the sky. So it could be that you could shoot 30 seconds, could be a minute, could be two minutes, however it is. You keep pushing it a stop at a time, stop at a time, using longer and longer shutter speeds, looking at the photos on the back of the camera until they start to blur or start to trail. And then you know what? I've gone too long. Let's back it off a stop. And let's, that's the longest shutter speed that I can use in this case. Okay. So with a perfect tracker, how long of an exposure could be used? Really indefinitely. You could keep going. What's going to be the downside, though, of going too long? What's going to happen? It's nighttime, but what can happen? Noise. noise, for sure, right? You'll get more noise. What else? You'll just overexpose, right? Like the amount of light in the sky eventually will be too much. Even though it's nighttime, four minutes is a lot of time in the night, even at a very, very low ISO. So that brings me to now that we kind of learned how to ensure that our stars are sharp. We need to talk a little bit about exposure. How do we actually expose for these objects? We've, we're out in the field. We've got our camera set up. It's tracking. Where do we put our aperture? Where do we put our ISO? Where do we put all that kind of thing? Okay. Well, shutter speed, we know where we're going to put that. We're going to put that as long as we can without getting trails. So that's the 400 rule if we don't have a tracker. If you do have a tracker, it's whatever you figure out through just stepping it up and seeing when you get trails. Okay, So we know that one. That's really easy. We're going to go as long as we can go. Aperture is our second control. 
probably if it's really dark out, we're going to be wide open. F2.8, F4, F5.6, whatever your lens can do as far as letting a lot of light in, that's what we're going to want. You really don't want to stop down um, unless you know your lens is kind of blurry at its widest open. You could stop down a little bit, but really I'd shoot wide open all the time. F2.8, F1.4, F2, whatever you have, use it. So really, the only control we have to use to make our exposure right or wrong is ISO, right? Because the other ones are kind of set. So with ISO, that's where we have our creative control. Not really creative, it's just getting the proper exposure. Okay? So here's what I do. I take a test exposure. All right, and I look at the histogram. I look at what the histogram is going to tell me. And you guys, what is the majority of an astrophoto going to be? What's, what's the photo major, majorly of? Just black sky, right? With a little object somewhere in the frame. So we would expect most of our information to be on the left side of the histogram in the darks. That's what's what we're looking for. Well, that histogram right there, that's about what I'm looking for when I'm exposing. That's about my goal. And what that's telling me is that, yes, we have a lot of dark stuff in the photograph, but are we clipping any of it? Is any of it touching that, right, that left-hand side? No. Right? We have detail in all of the darker areas, which is really, really what we want. If that was slid further to the left and slammed up against the side and we were clipping, that would be a good sign to raise the ISO and get yourself a little bit more light. Okay? So the goal is to get the majority of the information into the midtones and the shadows. That's essentially what we're going for with our exposing. And you guys, the ISO that's going to work, people always want, like, well, Forrest, what's the one ISO? It depends on so many things, like the moon. If the moon's out, the sky is much brighter than when the moon's not, right? If the atmosphere is thicker, if there's light pollution. Here in New York City, if I was to take an exposure, I would be at a much lower ISO than I would be in Montana, because Montana is much darker, at least to where we are, OK? So more light pollution equals a lower ISO. You'll start to blow out much faster. Everything will be brighter, OK? One thing you can do if you are in a city urban environment is you can actually buy filters that can reduce the effects of light pollution. They're really cool. Um, they're kind of expensive. They're around two or three hundred dollars. Everything in astrophotography is expensive. It's like little bits. It all adds up. It's just the way that it is. But you can buy filters that go in your camera that cut down the light from all of the common street light colors. So street lights have very consistent colors. They're very consistent types of bulbs. And so these filters block out all of those specific colors of light, but let through the colors that the objects in the sky are, which is pretty cool. You can buy a nice filter that will help you do that. And there's some really cool results that people have gotten with that. So that's problem one, right? The motions of the sky. The solution is either use a shorter shutter speed or buy a tracker. And that will get us through that first problem. Problem number two are environmental factors. How do we get around moon cycle, wind, temperature, all that kind of stuff? Honestly, you just plan ahead, but we're going to talk about what the environmental factors are. So let's look at some of these. The biggest one that I would say and the easiest to get around is the moon. If it's a full moon night, the moon is going to wash out most of what you're trying to look at. So honestly, for me, if it's clear and the moon's out, I look at those nights as like testing equipment nights. Those are nights I'll go out, because you can see really nicely, because it's a full moon, so you've got nice light to illuminate all your gear. That's a good night to test how much trailing you get with a 60 second exposure. You can go out and just take some exposures and see whether your mount can handle a minute long shutter speed. It's a testing time. You really want no moon or close to no moon to get those nice dark objects. Okay? Light pollution can be fixed with filters for sure. But if you can drive yourself to a nice dark sky site, that's really nice where the sky is really, really dim. Wind is a big one. This is a big object. If you don't have a super sturdy tripod, even a little bit of wind, these little tat little clips from my strap, they'll bump into the side of my camera and they'll shake it a little bit. So every little bit counts. So taking off any little dangly bits, if you have a strap, weighing down your tripod with a nice weight from the hook on the bottom of it, get this thing solid. But if you have too much wind, you just can't shoot. It just blows everything around too much. Another thing is atmospheric clarity. A lot of times the atmosphere will be clearer than it is on other nights. And that's just particulates in the atmosphere. Think like pollution, not light pollution, but actual pollution. Those little particulates in the sky will cut down on your quality as well. 
temperature is a big one. And temperature is big because of something we're going to talk about in a little bit, but it's also big just for your own comfort. If it's too cold, you're not going to want to stay out that long, and the shorter you stay out, the less good images you'll take. So keeping in mind what the temperature is. And then the last one would be the altitude of the object. And this is one that a lot of people don't think about. You guys, if you're shooting an object, a very dim object in the sky, you want to pick an object that's very high in the sky versus down near the horizon. And the reason is, is that you're actually shooting through less atmosphere when you're shooting an object high in the sky. Think of the atmosphere wrapping around the Earth, right? If you're shooting something down near the horizon, you're shooting through the atmosphere diagonally. So you're shooting through much more atmosphere to get to your object. Something right above your head, very thin layer of atmosphere, therefore things will be sharper, more crisp, all of that kind of thing. Okay? So, a couple ones I want to just touch on real quick because there's some real good tools out there. One of them is light pollution. There's actually a website called lightpollutionmap.info. It's a great website. If you go there, you can look at the light pollution map for the United States. Actually, they have the whole world in there now. And you can see where areas are where there's no light pollution and where there's a lot of light pollution. Unfortunately, the East Coast is kind of hard. <laughs> uh, over in Montana, it's pretty easy to find dark skies. You drive like 15 minutes from our house, and it's one of the darkest skies. It's really awesome. But there are little pockets, and that's important. There are special zones in the country that are dark sky sites. And there are places you can drive to where you can get nice, dark skies. And that will help you get much better images as well. Another one is a website that I really like is Weather. A good place to find the weather that's uh, kind of an astronomer-focused weather is the cleardarksky.com, cleardarksky.com. They put out what's called the clear sky chart, which is basically built for astronomers and astrophotographers. And they put out these charts that walk through every location. So you pick a location. This one's the one for New York City. I downloaded it on Wednesday, so you can see it right there. And they give you the cloud cover, the different type of cloud cover, the transparency, which is how transparent the atmosphere is, the seeing, which is another type of astro astronomy or astrophotography term for atmospheric clarity, basically, and then darkness. Overall, how dark is it? If the moon is out, the darkness won't be as dark. You won't be able to get as dark of images. And right below these charts, there's a key that explains what all the different little colored boxes are. So you can see day by day, time by time, a very nice all-in-one place representation of what the what the imaging opportunities will be like for the night. They also give you wind and temperature, which is also cool. So you can see, oh, it's going to be really windy, it's going to be cold, probably one that I want to skip. Okay? So cleardarksky.com is awesome as well. So problem number two, environmental factors. Solution is plan to go out on a moonless night with low wind, nice clear skies. Pretty easy. Okay? Now for the big one. The big, big, big one. Noise and vignetting. Optical problems. Things that are, have to do with our sensor. And you guys, this is going to get really in depth. <laughs> I'm just going to prepare you for it. Um, this is going to be basically barely scratching the surface of uh, something called calibration frames with astrophotography and ways that we can help eliminate noise. But I want to tell you that there's no way in an hour or hour and 15 minutes that I can give you as much as you need to know about this. Just look at this as an introduction, kind of get you started. Some of this might go over your head. That's a good sign and kind of maybe read up on it if this interests you because there's a lot to it. Also, you don't have to do this stuff. You can take astro images without doing this stuff that'll still look really good, but I want to kind of give you guys an idea on how to get the best stuff, how to get the stuff that you'll be really proud of. Okay? So, how can we fix noise? That's what I want to look at first. And how can we fix vignetting? There's, there's two things that happen. First of all, what is noise? Noise is what? What's it look like? Yeah, different colored pixels, grain, looks kind of like speckles, right? And sometimes it's colorful. Other times it's just luminance noise. It's just brightness and darkness variations. All right, vignetting. Vignetting is dark corners, right? And a lot of photographers ask me, they're like, Forrest, why would I care about vignetting with astrophotography? Normally, vignetting is a non-issue, right? You go in Lightroom or Photoshop and you brighten your corners up. Really easy, takes two seconds. The problem with, is with astrophotography, you think about this. The object we're trying to shoot is only 1 or 2% brighter than the sky behind it, right? There's very little contrast between object and sky. And so what we need to do is we need to add contrast 
to the image in order to separate the object from the sky, to get the nice black sky and the nice bright object. Well, when you add contrast to the object, you're also adding contrast to the vignetting. And all of a sudden, those corners that were only slightly dark become like pure black, and everything else is still bright. So vignetting actually becomes a really big issue with astrophotography because of how much we need to stretch out the values in the image. It's just the way that it works. Okay. So like I said, noise, like you guys said, noise is speckles, little variations in our star, in our background. It just looks like randomness, unevenness, grain, kind of like film grain. Um, things like that. So how do we fix the noise? We can do two things to fix the noise. The first is we can, and here's this is kind of where you start to think, oh, that makes some sense. Noise, is it the same on every picture or is it different on every picture? Different. It's random. It's a, it's a random variation. Meaning if I stood here with a tripod and I took the same picture of you guys twice, and I looked at the noise and the shadows of the image, the noise would be very different one frame to the next. The average of everything would be about the same, be the same brightness or darkness, but the exact this pixel's bright, this pixel's dark, so on and so forth, that's going to be different every single picture you take. So what you can do because noise is random is you can actually take a bunch of images of the same thing. So image, 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 image of the same object, just photo after photo after photo. And if you take all those images and you average them together, so you stack them all up, you align them. Obviously, they need to be perfectly aligned. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. But you align them all. And then you average the noise. Some images, one pixel is brighter. Some images, that pixel is darker. Some images, a little brighter. Some images, a little darker. But on average, it's the same correct value. So the more images you take and the more images you average together, the more reduced your noise will be. Does that make sense, you guys, right? Because noise is averaged. So if you're shooting, and you need to use and you're using 30 second shutter speed don't just take one photo at 30 seconds take 10 take 20 take 30 every additional picture you take average it together and your noise gets reduced sweet super easy and that's free you don't have to buy anything you literally just do it, it takes more time but whatever right you live so that's where the alignment comes in. So there's programs that can, the question was, for those of you watching live, was uh, what about ghosting? What about the movement between frames? Well, between frames, yes, there will be a little bit of movement, You know, especially if you're like uh, on a tripod without a tracker. There's going to be a lot of movement between images. But the alignment programs that we'll talk about in a bit, they're smart enough to look at the stars and get the images perfectly laid on top of one another. So when it averages, it gets it nice and sharp for you. It's really cool. Second thing we can do, we can use what are called calibration frames to help even more. So calibration frames are uh, images of kind of the bad things in our photos that we can subtract away from the good information and leave us what we want. It's really, really cool. So let's first talk about technique one which is taking multiple lights. And here's where I need to introduce you guys to a new term that if you get into astrophotography, you'll see everywhere. And that is a light. So a light frame is an image of the object itself. So if I have my camera and I'm pointing it at the Andromeda galaxy, if I take a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, that's referred to as a light frame. And you'll see that all over with astrophotography. Okay? What you want to do is shoot a lot of light frames. As an example, I usually shoot to get between a half hour and an hour worth of total exposure time on an object. Now you may say, all right, well, let's think about that. Half hour to an hour. Well, if you're shooting 30 second exposures, right, how many exposures would we need to take to get an hour's worth of data? Well, 30 seconds, that means two to a minute, right? And there's 60 minutes in an hour, so 120, exactly. 120 exposures would give us uh, an hour's worth of content, right? If you're doing one second exposures, how many do we need to shoot to get to an hour? A bunch, right? Uh, 3,600, I think? Yeah, 60 times 60, uh, right? A lot of exposures. So it really depends on your length of time, but the more lights you can shoot, the more reduced your noise will be. That's the long story short. Second way are calibration frames. And these are equally important. These are things that we're going to talk a lot about. So calibration frames have a huge impact on your image. And basically what they are, you guys, is they rely on shooting images of basically nothing. You're basically just taking images of 
random things. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But the, you're not shooting the object. You're shooting non-object things, OK? There's three types of these. There's three types of calibration frames. We have darks, we have flats, and we have bias. Darks, flats, and bias frames. And the reason there are three of them is because there's three different kind of bad things that our sensor does that these will correct for. Okay, These are fixing inherent issues with sensors, things that sensors do that we don't want. And each type is designed to help us get a cleaner image. Okay, Now, I want to take a minute before I get too in-depth in this. If you're sitting here and you just want to get basic astrophotography and you want to take good photos, you can totally skip calibration frames and just take a bunch of lights, take a bunch of light frames, light frame, light frame, light frame, stack them all together, and you'll get a reasonably good image, like 90% as good as what calibration frames will give you. But if you really want to take it further, it's important to know about these two. So calibration frames kind of go in tandem with taking a lot of lights. So let's start by talking about darks. Darks are the first of the calibration frames I want to talk about. Okay. Darks are literally a picture of your noise. That's what they're essentially doing. Okay, so let's think about this. We all talked about what noise is. It's random variations on your images. Well, what variables influence how much noise we have in a photo? Like if we're looking at multiple photos, what, what is going to influence how much noise an image has? What's one factor that influences that? How much noise we have in a photo? ISO. ISO is probably the most common one. In fact, I put it first because I figured someone would say that first, right? ISO is probably the most common one. What's another factor that influences how much noise we have on a photograph? Exposure. exposure. How long is the exposure, right? Noise is generated usually from heat building up in our sensor. So the longer the exposure, the more noise we're going to get, right? So exposure length plays a role as well. What's a third one? And this is particularly important with astrophotography that you might not think of otherwise. It's another thing. If it has to do with heat, what might you come up with? Yeah, no, the, the temperature outside, just the ambient temperature where you are, right? In Montana, before we left, it was like five degrees outside. The amount of noise that I'm going to get, I'm making Montana sound great, aren't I? <laughs> it's super cold. There's nothing there. It's actually a beautiful place. You should totally go. Uh, but in, in Montana, it was like five degrees. The amount of noise that I'm going to get with the same ISO, same exposure time, on a five degree night versus a night in the summer when it's 60 or 70 degrees is astronomically different. The ambient temperature, just the temperature that your camera is sitting in, plays a huge difference in how much noise you're going to have. So you don't just have ISO and exposure length, you also have the ambient temperature of the place. Okay? So we need to talk about how to take darks. How do we take photographs of our noise? What is a dark frame? All right. Well, what we're going to do, let's think about this. We're out there shooting lights. We're taking nice photos of the Andromeda galaxy going overhead. We get done for the night. We're tired, and we want to shoot some darks. OK. Well, if a dark, if the goal of a dark is to be the same amount of noise on the dark as there was on our light, what do we need to keep the same between the lights and the darks? Exposure time and ISO. OK. Right? Exposure time and ISO and temperature temperature, right? We want to keep those three things the same. But what do we not want to happen if we're trying to shoot a dark? We don't want any light to hit the sensor, because we're really trying to get an image of the noise. So you guys think about this, right? If I take an image of all you guys in this room, and I take the shot, that has the image in it, the, the information of you guys, plus a bunch of noise in the shot, right? How could I get the same image but just the noise? I could put the lens cap on. Same temperature, same ISO, same shutter speed, take a picture, and I would just be getting the noise of the shot before it. So cameras actually do this. You guys have probably heard of long exposure noise reduction, right? The camera takes one picture, and then it takes a second picture after it, and it, it basically subtracts the two. It's doing dark frame subtraction without calling it dark frame subtraction. Okay? So let's look at this. The way that I do it is when I'm done shooting my lights, all I do I don't have it with me, but I put my lens cap on, and I shoot a few photos with the exact same exposure setting. So I don't touch anything. I literally just boop, 
picture, 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 picture. Probably not pushing the button because they're like 30 second exposures. Get a cable release, lock it down, and go inside for a little bit. You don't need to do that. But would I want to bring this in the house and then shoot my darks? No, because then the temperature is different. You literally leave it where it is, you put the lens cap on, and you take those photographs. Okay? So it's got to be the same temperature as when you shot your lights. Another technique that I do, you guys, is I like to go inside and go to sleep when I'm done shooting my lights because I'm tired. So what I'll oftentimes do is I'll put my lens cap on, I'll put my camera in the car, I'll close the car door because I don't have a garage in my house. I'll put it in the car, I'll lock the car, and I'll have it shoot darks in the car while I go to bed. Assuming the car is basically the same temperature, car's off obviously, roughly the same temperature in the car as it is outside where I was shooting my, my light frames. Pretty easy. There's ways you can get creative about it. I've put my camera in the fridge before. Uh, when I know the fridge is the same temperature as the outside, if I haven't wanted to do it, like there's all kinds of creative ways. You just want to make sure the temperature and the settings are the same. Okay. Now, people always ask, how many darks should I shoot? Well, again, noise is random, right? So the more darks you get, the more of an idea of what the noise is in the images. So I actually like to shoot more darks than I shoot lights. And you may say, like, whoa, mind blown. Darks are easy. You literally put the lens cap on, you say, camera, take 100 pictures, and you leave it alone. You don't have to do anything. You just let it sit there. It sits in the car, sits in the fridge, sits outside. You don't need to monitor it at all. So it's pretty easy to shoot darks. I shoot darks. You can shoot darks on cloudy nights. If you have a night that's cloudy, same temperature as the night before it when it was clear, you put it out on a cloudy night, shoot darks, lens cap's on, no one cares. Easy, OK? Here is, behold, a beautiful dark frame. Oh, it's so pretty, right? Here's a close up. Look at all that pretty noise. So nice, all right? And that noise is different every single picture, right? And so image, image, image of all the noise, and then you average them all together, and you get a real good idea of what your noise looks like, OK? So that's how you shoot darks. Now, what do we do with these darks once we've shot them? Say you got a couple hundred darks, and you want to do something with them. Well, what we actually do is we subtract them from the lights. And this is where we're going to do some very simple math. I promise you'll be OK. It's not that hard. This is really cool. If our images equal good information plus noise, right? Every image has really good information in it plus some noise. Well, if we take the image and we subtract the noise, which is the dark frame, what are we left with but just the good information? We're basically getting down to what it is we actually want. And that's what dark frame subtraction does. It, we take our lights, we subtract the darks, and we're left with good, nice, crispy, clean data. Does that make sense, you guys? Right? Pretty cool. Just like that. Now, those are darks. Let's talk about flats. Flats are the next one. Calibration frames. Okay? So, Flats, as the name suggests, are too correct for vignetting. Vignetting is the thing where the corners darken in our frames. And like I said, when you increase your contrast, you're increasing the contrast of the corners as well. They get even darker. So a flat, you guys, is literally a photo of the vignetting in the frame. It's literally an image of the vignetting. So here's an example. This is a flat frame. All right, That's what a flat looks like. What do you see? heck of a lot of vignetting, right? Do you see this dust spot right here? So it actually gets dust spots in it. It fixes a lot of different things. Flats will fix dust as well. If you have dust on your sensor, a flat frame will fix it. So how do we shoot them? How do we take a picture of the flat? All right, well, here's the thing we got to think about. What does vignetting and the amount of vignetting you get depend on very greatly? The lens, right? Specifically, if it's a zoom lens, you guys have probably noticed, if, you, if your lens is zoomed all the way out or all the way in, you might notice there's more or less vignetting depending on how you're zoomed. Also, aperture. You guys have probably adjusted your aperture sometimes and seen more or less vignetting happen. A lot of wide angle lenses, if they're full wide and they're wide open, they get a lot of vignetting. It's just kind of the way that it works, OK? So what we need to make sure of is that when we take our flats, <laughs> Nothing is different about our flats than when we shot our lights, right? Our lights are the images of the object. We want the flats to have the exact same amount of vignetting in them as the light frames. Otherwise, there's no reason to even shoot them, OK? So you don't want to change the focus. You don't want to change the zooming. You don't want to change the lens position. You really like, or aperture, you really just don't want to touch anything up here. So usually what I do, let me just kind of walk you guys through my, my workflow. I'm out there, I'm shooting my 
shooting my light frames. Obviously, I'm on my tracker, right? I shoot all the light frames, yada, yada, yada. It's on a cable release, and it just runs. I then do my darks. I just told you guys about that. For darks, I put the lens cap on. I put it in the car. I tell the cable release to take 100 photos, and I go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning, I have 100 dark frames. Same settings, just with the lens cap. Then it's time to shoot my flats. Well, with flats, I'm very careful not to touch my zoom ring. I'm very careful not to touch my aperture ring. I'm very careful not to touch my focus ring. I don't touch any of that stuff. I take the lens cap off, OK? I put it on aperture priority. I actually just move my aperture over to aperture priority mode. If you have a Canon or Nikon, it's different on the Fuji. But same thing. You put it on aperture priority mode. Okay, You leave the ISO and the aperture the same. Obviously, that's why we're doing aperture priority, not shutter priority. We leave the aperture and the ISO the same. And then what I do, and this is super technical, it's called the white t-shirt flat technique. And it works really, really well. You take a white t-shirt and you stretch it over the front of your lens. And you rubber band it onto your lens hood or onto the lens. Just a very clean, nice white t-shirt. Get a new one. I have a new one that's just my astrophotography t-shirt, and I stretch it over the top. You rubber band it on. And what you want to do is you want to take a photo of the dawn sky. So when the sun comes up in the morning and you wake up and your, your darks are done, aperture priority, pointing at the dawn sky, t-shirt is stretched over the front of the camera, and picture, 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 picture. Shoot like 20 of them. And you just take images. I move between frames. I kind of just, I just like literally off my front porch, hold my hand up toward the sky, click, 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 come inside and get warm. And that's pretty much all there is to it, OK? What is that doing? Why the dawn sky? What does that do for us? What can we assume about the dawn sky? It's pretty evenly illuminated, right? There's not a lot of variation in the dawn sky. The dawn sky is mostly just blue or white. It's pretty even, right? Well, this is all about, flats are all about taking an image of a perfectly evenly illuminated source. Um, and because what that means is if we know our images of something evenly illuminated, any vignetting we see was not caused by what we were shooting, but it was caused by the lens itself. And that's why that's super key and super important. Okay, So once we have those flats taken, we're actually going to divide our lights by them. Okay, And this is something that you don't have to do. I say divide and subtract and all these things. There's software that does this for you. It's not like you're d doing this manually somehow. There, there's, there's software that makes it really easy. But you basically divide your lights by them. If you think about that, dividing something out, the darker areas will get brighter, the brighter areas will get darker, and everything will become even and flat. It's really, really cool. It's, it's just an amazing process. Okay, So flats are images of an evenly illuminated light source. One quick thing I'll mention, some people like to build flat boxes, as they're called, which is actually like a light box. Picture a light box from the film days. Evenly light boxes were really evenly illuminated. Really evenly illuminated source. They'll actually take that evenly illuminated light box, and they'll plunk it down right on top of their camera. And they'll just picture, 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 picture of the evenly illuminated light source. And then you don't have to go outside and use a white t-shirt and all that kind of stuff. You can just picture, picture, picture right in your house, and you're done. That's all there is to it. OK, so there's different ways to do it. The t-shirt method is cheap, easy. You need a rubber band and a white t-shirt. Everyone has one. It's pretty easy. So there you go. All right, we have darks. We have flats. The third and final are bias frames, bias frames. This is the most technical one, but it's also important. Um, this kind of gets into how sensors work. So I'm going to go pretty quick through this, because a lot of it's not that important to know. But here's how we shoot bias frames, OK? Basically, bias, you guys, is, and this is something I recommend if you're nerdy, you get into, because I really like how sensors actually work, like how CCD or CMOS sensors, the way that they capture light is really interesting to me. It's really cool to know that stuff. But basically, bias, bias the term, is the voltage that's applied to your sensor before it takes an image. Basically, there's this bias voltage. The camera pumps a bunch of energy into the sensor and brings all the little pixels up to the same voltage. Well, here's the problem. Whenever you pump a bunch of energy into a bunch of different pixels, the exact amount of energy given to each pixel on your sensor is a little bit different. And when I say the value of each energy on each pixel is a little bit different, what does your mind instantly go to? Different values on different things means noise, random variations, things that aren't even, aren't perfectly illuminated. 
bias is another type of noise that we deal with as astrophotographers. Okay? It basically just means that each pixel has a slightly different voltage. And that's before you even take a picture. That literally just means like the camera charges up the pixels ready to take a shot. And it charges each pixel a little differently. And therefore, you have bias noise before you've even taken a picture, just the initial charge of them. Okay? We need to correct for this. Very, very easy to do this. ISO and aperture, the same as our lights. Okay? We're going to put on the lens cap. So you guys, this is uh, I've now come in from shooting my flats. I put my lens cap on. I take the white t-shirt off. I put the lens cap on. Okay? I increase my shutter speed to the fastest possible shutter speed there is. So most cameras, that's like 1 8,000th of a second, 1 4,000th of a second. And I have the lens cap on. So in 1 8,000th of a second, with the lens cap on, what is your camera going to be recording? Any light, is any light going to hit the sensor in that amount of time with the lens cap on? There's no way, right? Nothing will hit the sensor. No photon will make contact with that sensor, which means what are we recording? We're recording the initial voltages given to each pixel on the sensor. Isn't this kind of cool, right? It starts to make sense. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? We're literally recording the initial voltage given to each pixel because there's no time for that voltage to change because there's no light that hits the sensor, and there's not enough time for any noise to build up over time. It's just the initial values given to the sensor. Here, behold, is a beautiful bias image. Oh, it's so beautiful, right? It, that's what bias looks like. It's just a plain old thing. Do you guys see that faint square box in the middle of it? That's a weird byproduct of my specific sensor. For some reason, when Fuji made this sensor, there's a section of it that has a different amount of voltage applied to it very slightly than everything else. Well, in my final image, that would show if I wasn't correcting with bias. Kind of cool. All right? So what do we do with all these bias images? We subtract them away, and we end up with a clean image. Okay, So let's talk a little bit about that process. Let's summarize real quick and then talk about the stacking process of this whole thing. All right, Summar summary time. So lights are images of your object. It's the good information. We want to stack a lot of those together to help eliminate noise. Simple. Okay. If you're only ever going to do one thing to improve your astrophotography, do that at least. Then we say, if you want to, add in darks. Darks are images with the same settings and temperature, but you have your lens cap on. Simple. Flats are images of a flat field. So you could use a flat box, like a light box on your camera, or Dawn, Dawn Sky with a t-shirt, something like that. Aperture priority, same ISO, and aperture as your light frames. Again, you don't even want to change focus. You just want to very like baby the lens, pick it up, click, 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 Dawn Sky, put it back down. Bias frames are images of the bias voltage. That's the lens cap, same ISO as the lights, and the fastest possible shutter speed. Okay. Then we stack. We put all these images together into one. And what stacking does, you guys, is it adds the lights together and it averages them. It subtracts away the darks, it subtracts the bias frames, and it divides by the flats. And by doing all of that stuff, it gives you a very, very clean image. Okay. Now, I've told you before, you don't have to do this manually. So you'll actually use a piece of software to do this for you. And there's a few that I would recommend. The first is one called Deep Sky Stacker. It's free. It's awesome. And in fact, if you guys want to learn more about it, another little URL I'll direct you to is rmsp.tv slash stacking. I did a YouTube video specifically on how to use Deep Sky Stacker. Um, natively, it only runs on Windows computers. But there's a guy who has figured out a way to make it run on Mac using something called Wine, which basically runs it through the whole thing. There, there's ways to do it. So you can, you can use it on both. There's also a program called Nebulosity. It costs money. It's about, I think it's $80, something like that. It's a little bit cleaner, a little bit more feature rich than Deep Sky Stacker, but costs money. And then Pix Insight is like the legit fancy $300 Photoshop of astrophotography. Uh, if you want like the one stop shop, Pix Insight is the thing. Notice though, you guys, I'm not putting Lightroom or Photoshop on here. They can't do this stuff. Uh, unfortunately, Adobe hasn't really built in much of any Astro feature set into their programs. But Deep Sky Stacker is free. So literally, for no money, you can go shoot all of the calibration frames, stack them, get the final resulting image without paying anything. Kind of cool. All right. 
That's problem number four, that's problem number three, I should say, getting a nice clean image with no noise and no vignetting. How are you guys feeling? Ready for more? All right, the next ones are, are fairly straightforward, so let's, let's keep cruising. So problem number four is finding your object, finding what it is you actually want to photograph. Which a lot of people are like, that doesn't sound hard. But then you get out there and you're like, uh, <laughs> like, there's black and a bunch of little stars. Where is this faint nebula that I can't see with my object, with my naked eye, right? So the first step to finding the object that you want is planning well, OK? I would very strongly disadvise you to, I don't want you guys to go out there into the world go out to take astrophotos without any idea of what you're trying to shoot. You want to have an object, an idea of at least an object that you want to shoot before you go outside. Because if you're just looking up at the sky and you get like a phone app out and you're like, oh, I think I'll shoot the North American Nebula tonight. Where is it? And you find out it's way too dim to shoot it anyway. And pick your object ahead of time, OK? So planning is a big thing. Here are some planning software programs that I would take a look at. Um, the one I would wholeheartedly recommend is Stellarium. Stellarium runs on Mac and PC. It's free. It's awesome. And it's, it's just great. It's free and awesome. That's pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> free is good. There's also Voyager and the Sky X. Those are paid programs that have more stars, more objects, more customizability. But if you're just an amateur astrophotographer trying to get some really good stuff, Solarium's great. Okay. Now you have your object picked. We want to talk about how to find it. How do we actually find it when we're out there in the field? So here are some tips that I want to give you guys on finding your target. First thing I would say is if you have a zoom lens, zoom it out all the way. If you have a 70 to 200, go to 70 because you'll get more in your frame. And if you can get an object centered at 70 millimeters, you can zoom into 200. And guess what? It'll still be centered. That's the nice thing about zooms. They zoom in the middle of where they're supposed to be. Another thing, live view. Don't use the viewfinder on your camera. If you have a mirrorless camera, you can because you're looking at a screen. But if you have an SLR, don't use the viewfinder because if you can't see it with the naked eye without your camera, you're really not going to be see it through that little tiny dim viewfinder. It's just not going to work. So live view, and you guys, live view is highly dependent on what the current settings are on the camera, meaning the little preview you see on the back of the camera will get brighter or darker depending on what your settings are on your camera. So put it in live view, crank your ISO to the highest ISO, Put your shutter speed on your slowest shutter speed and open up your aperture all the way. That doesn't mean that's how you're going to shoot. That's just how you're going to find your target is with those maximum as bright as you can get settings. Obviously, your highest ISO, 12,800 or however high some cameras go to now, is going to look terrible. But to find the object, it might be just what you need. OK? Other thing I would say is use an app to look for patterns. Look for pattern recognition. This is huge. Um, I Actually, a little bit of my background, I got my bachelor's degree in astrophysics at the University of Montana. And in astrophotography, when, astrophysics, when we were learning about that, we obviously had to do a lot of work on telescopes and doing like actual astronomy research on different objects. When we did that, I had a professor who said, like 90% of astronomy is pattern recognition. It's being able to find the right object and looking for unique star patterns and then trying to find those through the telescope or on your camera. So what I'll usually do is I'll have my object picked out. I'll zoom into it on, on my little app on my phone. And I'll find it. And I'll look, oh, that little pattern of three stars, that's really uh, unique. I haven't seen that many other places. I'll go to my camera. I'll zoom in on live view. And I'll look for that same pattern of stars. And as soon as I can find that, I can get it centered. And boom, I've got my object. So finding unique patterns of stars is really important. All right. Um, Again, finding that. Another thing you guys can do is use a finder scope. So these are actually kind of cool. This is an accessory that you can buy. Um, but they make little hot shoe mounts that you put on the hot shoe of your camera. And you'll get a little mini telescope that has a wider field of view on it than what your lens has. Or even a little red dot finder, like from a rifle or a handgun, the little red dot scope you, see, you can see. You can buy one of those that mounts on top of your camera. And then you can look up through a very wide field of view type of thing versus trying to find it with this very narrow type of view on the camera. So that's something that you can look at buying as well. Um, Nice noises coming from over there. So exciting. Uh, all right, so that is that kind of little tips I would recommend. Um, basically, if you have trouble finding your target, live view, have an idea of what you're looking for, and start to get good at pattern recognition. It's kind of what I would go for. All right? 
Problem number five, focus. This is one we've probably all had. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to tell when things are sharp. Uh, I've taken many a photo that looks like that, right? Just a blur fest going on. Uh, I, one thing I do want to say, though, focus is not star trails, right? If your stars are trailing because you're not tracking with them or you're using too long of a shutter speed, that will cause stars that look like little lines. They'll look in one direction movement. You could be focused and still have trailing stars, okay? These, all these stars, they're blobby. They just look blobby. The, they're pointy enough, they're round, they're not trailing, but they're just blurry, they're not sharp. So focus and tracking are two different things, okay? So focusing, here's some tips that I would give you guys on focusing. I would use the same live view settings that we used when we were finding our target, meaning highest ISO, widest open aperture, 30 second shutter speed, all right? Always manual focus. If you try to autofocus on stars, it will not work, it will fail you 100% of the time. Quick note on manual focus. A lot of people have mirrorless cameras these days. Mirrorless cameras have that feature called focus peaking, where it will highlight in red or green or a certain color the things that are sharp. Turn that off too. It's very hard to tell with peaking on whether the stars are sharp or not. It does weird stuff. Sometimes it will peak on noise, it, weird stuff. So turn off focus peaking. Make sure you're on manual focus. What you're gonna do is you're gonna find a bright star and you're gonna turn the focus ring until the stars are as small as possible. What you'll see is the stars will be big and bloated. They might even look like donuts. You'll get little donut shaped stars depending on the optics and the lens. But you'll have a big bloated star. You'll twist that focus ring and the star will get smaller and then it'll get bigger again as you twist through the range. And so you kinda of wanna go back and forth. It'll get smaller and then bigger, smaller than bigger, and eventually it'll just stay small as you kinda of hone in on where that focus position is. And that's true on a wide lens or a long lens. Uh, with live view too, most live view cameras have the ability to zoom in on live view. You definitely want to zoom in using the live view screen so you can see one star really big. Turn it until that star is as tiny as you can get it. Okay. Also, the brighter the star, the easier of a time you're going to have. If you have a big, nice, bright star, it's going to be very easy versus a really, really dim star. Okay. Just one last thing I should say on that too. Um, is some lenses, depending on the quality of the lens, they will actually be blurry around the, out, around the edges. If you have a kind of a cheaper lens, a lot of times the edges of the frame will be blurry all the time, just it never gets quite sharp. If you have a lens like that, you want to make sure that when you go on live view and you focus, that you're picking a star in the middle to focus on versus a star on the edge of the frame to focus on. Because you want to make sure that everything in the middle is the crispest crispest, that's a hard word to say. And if you focus on the edges, you're not necessarily checking that. So go ahead and do that. Also, I bring gaff tape out in the field, gaffer's tape, and I tape down my focus ring once I have it set. Because it's a pain in the butt to get it set and then you bump it, you accidentally twist that instead of zoom and you lose it all. So getting some gaff tape is good. Now, another thing, temperature compensation. You guys, as metal heats and cools, it expands and contracts which can change your focus dramatically through the course of the night. So I recheck my focus every 30 or 45 minutes. I'll go back, I'll zoom in on a star, and I'll make sure it's perfect. Because especially if your camera came from your house, very warm, and went out into cold climate, it's gonna change a lot. It's, it's change in temperature is gonna be huge, and therefore your focus will change a lot over the course of that exposure. So rechecking is important. And then, I'll, as I said, use a bright star that's good too. Make sure you've got a nice, bright, crisp star. Okay? So, problem five with focus. You want to use manual focus. You want to use live view. You want to use a focus mask. That's something I could say too if you guys want to research that. Focus masks are these little, uh, basically looks like a uh, circle with some slits cut into it. There's a lot of different types of them, but you can buy those and put them over the front of your lens. Uh, and they create a little diffraction pattern, and you can use them to help you focus. Unless you're using a very long lens, I find that they're pretty ineffective. So like 70 millimeters, even 200 millimeters, not really long enough to fully utilize that. If you have a telescope that's like 2,000 millimeters or 1,500 millimeters, they're awesome. But for our camera stuff, it's kind of too wide for to be useful with a focus mask. All right? So you guys, 
Those are our problems, right? We now know about tracking, we know about environmental issues, we know about the problem of noise and how that works, finding our targets, focusing, all of that kind of stuff. I guess I want to kind of get towards the end by saying I really recommend that like you guys start small. Start with out trying all of these things because I find a lot of people who start with astrophotography they're like alright I gotta shoot my darks and my flats and my lights and my bias frames. Don't start with that. Start by just going out and taking maybe 10 light frames of an object that you're looking for and try to get focus perfect and try to get nice round stars. Use the 400 rule, buy a tracker, whatever it is. But start super small. And then say, all right, what's wrong with this image? How can I improve it? What steps can I take? And say, oh yeah, I remember when Forrest talked about dark frames. Let's add darks into the next time I go out. You add some darks, and you see how those images change and improve and do things. The cool thing is, the stacking program I talked about, Deep Sky Stacker, when it's done stacking, what it kicks out is just a TIFF file that you can open up into Lightroom, you can open up into Photoshop, you can edit it just like any other picture, but it has all of that data from all of those lights and darks and flats and biases in one place, and you can really push it and pull it quite a bit. It's pretty cool, all right? So here are my steps I'd say to get started, and then we'll take some questions uh, if you guys have any. First thing I would say is just go out with a camera, um, go out with a camera, with a tripod, with a cable release, and take a few lights of a bright object. A couple that I would recommend would be Orion. The Orion Nebula is up in the winter. It's up right now. It's a very big, bright nebula. You can actually see it with the naked eye if it's a dark sky. Take a few photos of it, see what you can get, OK? Next thing I would add in are calibration frames. Add in some, some darks, some flats, some biases, and see how that improves your photos, all right? Then buy a tracker. If you really get into it, invest a couple hundred dollars in a tracking system, and then you can start to use a longer shutter speed with a lower ISO, giving you much better images. And then lastly, just keep learning and shooting. There's so many cool things to learn in astrophotography. I've literally spent thousands of hours researching this stuff on forum websites and doing it and learning, and that's why it's so cool. Like all these genres of photography, there's so much to astrophotography. It's just a really cool thing. All right, so thank you guys. Um, are there any questions from you guys? Anything you want to ask? Anything you're unsure of? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of these techniques could be used on a regular photography. Yes, that's a great. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the question was for those of you watching online: was uh, a lot of these techniques can be used for regular photography, which is totally true. Like if you shoot something that's repeatable enough mm -hmm. that you could use dark frames or flat frames to correct for vignetting or things like that, totally, you could use that with normal photography as well. Yep. And the second thing is the mm -hmm. focusing. Yeah. Uh, why can't you focus at infinity? Ah, that's a great question. So the question was, why can't you focus at infinity? On all of our lenses, there's a little mark that has the infinity symbol. Well, the problem is infinity is a, not a very clearly defined mark. It's very, uh, it's there, but I think you'll find infinity kind of varies a little bit. And also, infinity will vary a lot depending on temperature. As the temperature warms and cools, you've got to think about that mark is only in one place. And so, really, that's kind of the average for the average temperature. Temperature changes, it's not quite perfect. So infinity minus something, or infinity plus something, is still infinity. Yes, exactly. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, I think uh, what I would do is infinity is a good starting place. If you've got it marked, start the lens at infinity. But I think you'll find to get perfect focus, you're going to have to alter it just a little bit. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Forrest, what kind of filters were you talking about that help with light pollution? Or so, a name of it? it's actually just called a light pollution filter. Yeah. So, the question was what filters are good for uh, countering light pollution? They're just called light pollution filters. Um, one of my favorite ones is it's called a clip in filter. Uh, and it's actually, clip in means that it clips behind the lens. So, it actually clips right in front of your sensor. And that means that it's compatible with any lens you have or any telescope you ever want to use, stuff like that. So, you can look at clip in light pollution filters, they also sell them that screw on the front of the lens, the back of the lens, all kinds of different things. But yeah, light pollution filter. Um, they cost a couple hundred dollars, but they're very cool because again, uh, those street lights are very specific colors and it just brings all those down and it lets all the nebula, galaxy, pretty light through. Pretty cool. Yeah. I just remember something else. Yeah. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, Canon came out with a camera which is specific for the 60DA. Uh, yes. DA. Yep. Yep. Now, what does it? I didn't understand. Okay. Okay. That's a great question. So uh, the question was, uh, Canon and actually Nikon now both have made astro-specific cameras. Uh, Nikon had the D810A, 
and Canon had the 60D A. And the difference was that on all of our sensors, there is a little filter in front of the sensor that cuts down on light that makes people's faces look a little bit weird. It's a specific wavelength called hydrogen alpha. And what happens is they put a filter there which removes that light. And that makes people's skin tones look much more natural, looks much better, removes a lot of the red from our faces. The problem is that same wavelength is what all of the pretty red nebulas in the entire sky are. They're hydrogen alpha regions. And they emit this beautiful red light. So what Canon and Nikon did was they released specific cameras without that filter. It had a clear filter. So people's skin tones will look a little different than your normal camera, but nebulas and things like that look beautiful. They shine through perfectly. So if you get really into this, you can actually get any camera you want modified, which it's called Astro Modified, where they'll take that filter off, replace it with a normal filter, a clear filter, and you can get a lot more nebula light through the sensor. Like infrared, but, but, okay. like infrared, but, say, but different wavelength, yeah. Um, a visible wavelength instead of an infrared wavelength. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, if you get really into it, that's a good investment. It's a few hundred dollars to get a camera modified like that. But your nebula performance, what you'll get of red nebulas, is like double to three times as good, which is pretty dang sweet. Uh, you shoot for less time and you get good stuff. The what? Uh, a lot of different companies. I don't know any specifically off the top of my head. But if you just Google uh, like astrophotography hydrogen alpha filter conversion, you'll find it. Super common. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. How long is, like, you know how you, you mentioned that you take several images? Yeah. So, like, how long? Mm. Or, you know, how long of, like, total exposure time for a good photo? Usually about an hour or two hours, something like that. Um, you guys, a lot of that stuff that you see online, like if you just Google astrophotography and you look at like the eye candy that be beholds your eyes, the beautiful things, those are sometimes 50 hours, 100 hours, night after night after night of shooting images. Because you think about it, the more images you're going to take, the more lights you shoot, the less noise you're going to have. So the better result, because you're averaging all those frames together, right? So. Uh, for starting out an hour or two, as you get more into it and as you start shooting dimmer and dimmer objects, then you need more time. Yep, great question. Yeah? Did you get interesting photos using millimeters? Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah, no, question was, uh, can you get interesting photos using 200 millimeters? And yes, for sure. Um, a lot of the biggest objects like Andromeda or Orion or even a lot of the nebulas in the sky, they're actually, like, yes, one nebula is only like you need like a thousand millimeters to come in on just the one nebula. But oftentimes one nebula is next to another one, which is next to another one. And you can shoot a nice wide frame of three nebulas together, and it's just this beautiful, really cool thing with super small stars. So yes, there's tons to shoot with 200 millimeters for sure. Uh, my main camera I use, or my main telescope I use at home is a 400 millimeter, and that opens up a few more doors. Uh, but with 200, you can do really, really good stuff for sure. Yep, yeah. All right. Tips for shooting in the city? Shooting in the city, light pollution filter, make sure there's no moon, like do everything else right. Uh, no moon, light pollution filter, and then just uh, try to get as far out of the inner city as you can. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. I want to give a thank you to the event space. Uh, you guys have been awesome. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, thank everyone. And yeah, it was a pleasure being here. <laughs>